All right, so good morning. You're probably wondering why is there a mouse? Um, it's because we're doing the muscular system. You're thinking like, why are they muscles? Because it comes from Latin musculus, which means little mouse, um, which is just kind of always cracks me up. It's one of those things that, yeah, if you think about, like, if you're, uh, it's like, oh, look, it's like, it looks like there's like little mice running under my skin there. It's got to, there's something moving, running back and forth, you know, so it's like, for whatever reason, oh, there, there you can see like the little mouse running back and forth underneath there. So <laughs> it just always cracked me up that muscles actually comes from the root for mouse, um, which is not intuitive. Um, so give me just one moment here as I shift gears into the warm up. Okay, so warm up number thirteen. Share screen. All right, so this is stuff that we had covered you know, when we were talking of introducing the muscles, you know, obviously before the the exam, but this is the stuff that's going to be on exam three. A lot of people got it, although some people really, I mean, there was one, you know, one, <laughs> one that got none of them. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that you are kind of make, keeping up as we're getting towards the second half of the semester here, because we're going to start throwing in more like we had one big system for this last exam you know the next exam is going to have muscles and it's going to have the cardiovascular system which is pretty big as well as a respiratory system you know so you want to make sure that you keep up on this because we're going to be going through a lot of material and probably you know kind of speeding up a bit because we got a lot of ground to cover and the semester is going to be over before like you know by the middle of next month which is kind of crazy um all right excitation contraction coupling that's that connection from sending a signal down the motor neuron to actually having the muscle contract and it's just saying what is released within the muscle cell which ultimately allows the contractile proteins to form the cross bridges you know most people got it you know, calcium, calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which then it binds the troponin, which moves off tropomyosin out of the way, and then the actin and the myosin combined. You know, acetylcholine, that's the neurotransmitter that's released by the motor neuron at the neuromuscular junction. Um, so it's part of excitation contraction coupling, acetylcholine, but it comes before the calcium. You know, it's Signal comes down the motor neuron, releases acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine binds the nicotinic-cholinergic receptors on the sarcolemma, which then triggers an action potential across the entire sarcolemma, which then triggers the release of the calcium within the cell, which then continues the process. The sarcolemma of the muscle cell, most people got this again. It has the voltage gated ion channels that allow it to generate and propagate that action potential. Um, we're going to see this actually in a lab and when we do the EKG lab, if you put electrodes on your skin and just move your muscles around, you see all sorts of electrical activity because every time you contract the muscle cell, there's big action potentials that are spreading across the muscle cells. Um, we call it the electromyogram. If you put electrodes on your skin, and measure the electrical activity that's being produced by the by the muscles, you know, electro myo myo for muscle gram picture of the electrical activity of the muscles. 
Um, if you are holding a heavy weight and slowly lowering it as you fight gravity, the muscle that is working against gravity. So this muscle that's working against gravity as you slowly lower it, it's generating contractile force, it's pulling, but it's losing the battle because the weight is going down, gravity is winning. So if a weight, if a muscle is pulling and yet lengthening, we call that an eccentric isotonic contraction. Yeah, consensual doesn't exist. A concentric isotonic contraction would be if some the muscle was pulling but was actually getting shorter. Like if I was pulling and the weight was coming up, I was lifting the weight because the muscle was shortening. Um, you know, this one probably you all know you all know this from bio one ten. You probably knew it before you even got to you know got out of high school. Actin and myosin are the two main proteins that are working in your muscles to interact and generate the force. Um, and finally, muscle tissue again can only contract. That's been a theme we keep kind of hitting into the ground. You know, that's why you need to have you know antagonistic muscles, muscles that will undo an action of one of the muscles because muscles can only pull. Um, so any questions before we continue to dig deeper because we're going to finish up muscles today and add into the stuff we've already been talking about, you know, and then we'll be transitioning into the cardiovascular system. Comments? Nothing? Okay. I actually had a question um, for the um, isotonic, or sorry, um, I think it's isometric. Uh -huh. um, what would be an example of that? The ones where the muscle doesn't change. Like if you were holding a weight exactly at the same height, but it wasn't going up or down, but you had to generate force in order to not have it fall. Okay, so it's still contracting, it's just not changing in length. Yeah, so isometric means same length, right? Or if you were, you know, I always think of that far side, you know, school for the gifted where the kid is trying to push open the door that says, you know, pull. You know, that little kid is doing an isometric contraction. He's pushing hard, his muscles are generating force, but nothing is changing length, nothing's moving. Um, people, everybody's seen, I don't know, maybe not everybody has, maybe I should, it's like a good, <laughs> I don't know, these things just crack me up. Um, Like this little dude right here, he is experiencing an isometric contraction. He's pushing really hard, his shoulder muscles, his arm muscles, the back of his leg, He's, but nothing's changing length, nothing's moving. So this would be an isometric contraction. Um, all right, so let's continue looking at muscles. So for the first part, we're gonna continue focusing on skeletal muscle, right? Everything we've been talking about up to now has been skeletal muscle tissue, striated muscle, the voluntary muscle. This is gonna continue talking about skeletal muscle tissue. Um, after that, we're gonna talk you know, briefly about smooth muscle tissue, kind of its basic properties and how it's similar and different to skeletal muscle and then even more briefly about cardiac muscle. Um, but for right now, we are staying focused on skeletal muscle. Okie dokie. Um, so what is skeletal, actually all muscle tissue using to ultimately get the energy it needs to cock the myosin heads in order to 
create power strokes and stuff? What's ultimately the fuel that is that this motor, basically the muscle is kind of a motor. It burns fuel and it moves. So what is the, the core fuel for the muscle? ATP. ATP. It's ATP. And I, sh I should mention, like, while we're here, um, you know, we, we never actually kind of introduced muscles in terms of, like, what are all the functions of the muscular oops, muscles, muscle system? And you know, what are all the functions that the muscular system is playing in our body? You know, obviously, the movement. Right? We've been I talking think one is to maintain heat in the body. Yeah, so one is going to be temperature regulation. And it has to do with this idea that you know, the muscle is basically a motor or an engine that any kind of motor or engine is going to be inefficient in how it converts its fuel into movement, right? In your car, you put gasoline in the tank and you drive across town, but your engine gets really freaking hot. That's why you need to have a radiator and you know the coolant running through it and all that because a lot of the energy that is being released from burning the gasoline is not actually going into moving your car it's just becoming released to the environment as heat so it's the same thing in your muscles your muscles are burning atp and a lot of that energy is generating contractile force but like somewhere around a half of it is just going into the environment as heat um, you know, and sometimes it's just kind of, on, you know, it just happens, right? You're just kind of moving around, running around and realize, whoa, I'm like warmed up quite a bit. Um, if you've ever been outside and you're just standing still, you get cold. And if you start hiking around or dancing or whatever, all of a sudden it's like you're not so cold anymore because just moving your muscles is releasing a lot of this ATP energy as heat into your body. You know, and you can do it on purpose. You know, what's one of the ways your body maintains homeostasis? If you're starting to get too cold, what's one of the ways your body can respond to try to warm you back up? You shiver. You shiver, exactly. All right, so shivering is using the muscles, but not to actually move anything or go anywhere. It's actually just taking advantage that contracting muscles releases heat. So shivering is generating heat in the, like, because of that very, you know, normally you move around and the heat's the waste product and you just notice you're getting hotter or warmer, but you can also operate the muscles explicitly for the intention of warming up your body and not actually moving or going anywhere. So muscles are helpful for, you know, maintaining temperature regulation. You know, muscles are also kind of just kind of protection. Like, your abdominal cavity is completely um, vulnerable, except for the walls of your abdominal muscles. You got like four ply muscles, the rectus abdominis, the abdominal obliques, the, the internal obliques, the external obliques, the um, transverse abdominis. You've got like, it's kind of like um, if you like look at somebody head on. You know, your heart and your lungs, they're all protected in your rib cage. Um, you know, your brain is in your skull. They're like really protected just by bones. But when you get down to your abdominal organs, your stomach and your intestines and all of that stuff, the only thing protecting those are the muscles of your abdominal wall. But they come, it's like plywood, transverse abdominis, rectus abdominis. These are the external obliques, the internal obliques. So you've got fibers going in all these different directions and ultimately make a, you know, a pretty strong protection of all your abdominal organs in there. Um, you know, posture. If your muscles aren't contracting, you're just gonna like fall to the ground in a heap of bones, right? So just 
hanging out, not doing anything, your muscles are actually quite active to kind of hold your skeleton together. Um, posture also stabilize joints. A lot of your joints are held together by the muscles that are pulling the different bones together. Like your knee joint is really unstable except for like the muscles that around it that kind of keep the bones kind of you know oriented pr properly you know, in general if you have a sprain or you you know if, if you have a you dislocate something and stretch out the tendons or whatever if you want to like stabilize a joint and make it more um, less likely to you know kind of sprain again you want to work the muscles which are then going to kind of hold the bones together more firmly and keep the joint from, from dislocating again. So muscles are doing lots of stuff in addition to just moving you around, just kind of putting that out there. Um, and, and then back to the ATP, obviously muscles need ATP in order to do what they do. You know, and so far up to this point, we have seen one main um, biochemical pathway to make ATP. What has that been? What's the way we know? So like, you know, making the ATP. How do we how do we make ATP so far? What have we seen? Actually, we've seen a couple of ways. Cellular respiration. Yeah, so the kind of gold standard is cellular respiration. So cellular respiration, if you got the time and the oxygen, it's kind of the way to go because it's the most energy you can extract from like the sugar in order to actually make ATP. If you remember, we made like 36 ATP for every initial glucose molecule. But you also saw that it was really complicated. You had to go through the first the first 10 steps of glycolysis and then take the pyruvates into acetylcholines and feed those into Krebs cycle and make the NADHs, which then fed the electrons into the electron transport system, which pumped the protons into the intermembrane space, which then came back down through the ATP synthase. And finally, you got your ATP. So it takes a long time to ultimately make ATP using cellular respiration. So if you've got the time, it's great. And we're going to see we have muscle fibers that use cellular respiration. But for the muscle cells that are designed for more like really strong explosive movements, um, they need lots of ATP right now and they can't wait around for that big complicated process to go on. So we have other ways that muscle cells use to make ATP, like when we particularly when we get to like the fast twitch white white muscle fibers um, we're going to use other ways that are faster for making atp um, so what are other ways to make atp that we've we've talked about right, the, the very first what's the first part of cellular respiration glycolysis yeah that's glycolysis Right, glycolysis. This was the first steps. It's, it just happened in the cytosol, remember? And it basically started with the glucose. And by the end of it, what do you end up with? In terms of ATP. Two net ATP. Yeah, you end up with two ATP. Right, this ends up, it starts with a glucose, and you end up with 36 ATP. This one, you only end up with 2 ATP. But it's just these 10 directly linked steps. So you make them really fast. 
So if you start looking, instead of thinking about efficiency or this or that, you just think about what is the speed that ATP is getting produced in the cell? You just sit around how many ATPs per second are being produced? If you're doing glycolysis, even though you're only getting two ATP per glucose instead of 36 ATP per glucose, it's happening too, so much faster. This is gonna be two and a half times faster. You know, in thinking about ATP per second being generated in the cell, you know, then waiting around for this whole thing to happen. So a lot of the, you know, our cells, the muscle cells that are going to need lots of ATP fast are going to have these little glycogen granules in, you know, in the, in the cell. Glycogen, remember, was just glucose. It's kind of like starch. Glucose is all connected together in chains. So you can free up the glucose, cut the glucose apart in glycolysis, and you're making lots of ATP fast. Um, what's one of the downsides? What, what, what's produced as a byproduct if you're just doing anaerobic like this, just using the ATP without continuing on? Lactic acid. Yeah, so this is going to produce lactic acid. Um, there's an even faster way to make ATP. Um, that's going to be utilized in these fast twitch fibers. Um, and that's called the phosphagen system. So this utilizes this molecule called creatine, um, creatine phosphate. So creatine phosphate, creatine is this nitrogenous molecule, don't worry about the details, and it's connected to a phosphate. So creatine and a phosphate becomes creatine phosphate. And these little molecules are sitting around in your muscles. And what they can do is they can just instantly add a phosphate onto ADP and make it ATP again, right? Because remember, ATP breaks apart, becomes ADP, adenosine diphosphate plus phosphate. So this is after ATP has just been used up. What you can then do is use this creatine phosphate plus ADP, and ADP is just adenosine with two phosphates. And we just swap, we kind of swap that phosphate group onto there. And all of a sudden we have ATP, you know, and that creatine, which is going to have to get regenerated. Right? So it's one step, you've got ATP again. So this phosphagen system is going to be up to like four times faster than waiting around for cellular respiration. All right, so both glycolysis and this phosphagen system can make lots of ATP fast compared to waiting around for cellular respiration. Um, while we're here, what, what kind of enzyme do you think we use to transfer the phosphate group. What, what's the generic word we've talked about for enzymes that phosphorylate things? Kinase. Kinase, exactly. It's creatine kinase is the... Creatine kinase is basically the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. Like I, mean, I mentioned the very like first week, kinases are just going to keep showing up again and again. Um, so the problem with using these is that they're limited. Like you can only use glycolysis 
for until you kind of run out of the glucose that's available right there in the cell. Um, typically, this will last maybe about one and a half minutes before you've used up the glucose and you've built up a lot of lactic acid and need to kind of recover from it. Phosphagens even less. This lasts about 10 seconds. So like if you are sprinting in a, like a 50 yard dash, that's probably can just stay within the phosphagen system. Just making super large amount, making, making the ATP super fast. But after about 10 seconds, you've used up all your creatine phosphate. Then you can go into this glycolysis um, for another like minute and a half. And at the end of that, you kind of used up these anaerobic pathways, right? These are anaerobic. They don't need oxygen or anything. Um, but they have kind of incurred a cost. You've built up lots of lactic acid from the glycolysis. You've got all this creatine, which needs to get regenerated. So what we talk about, we talk about going into oxygen debt. So if you use up these anaerobic pathways and you've got like all this ATP super fast, it didn't come for free. It, you got it right now, but now to recover, you need about 11 liters of oxygen extra on top of what you normally would have had to breathe. So this idea of oxygen debt. So this kind of makes sense if you think about this. Um, if you are running, you're running really, 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 really fast. And then you stop. You're <laughs> <laughs> right. You're you are gasping for air and breathing hard, but you're not moving. You're standing there. You're like slumped over on your chair, like, you know, that oxygen is not being used to move your muscles right now that that oxygen is being used to pay off this oxygen debt to recover and regenerate all of these molecules take those you know all those lactic acid gets transported back to the liver and converted back into pyruvates and all of this so all of that all those metabolic pathways that um, run to recover from using those anaerobic pathways takes this extra oxygen, which is what you are gasping for while you are kind of recovering from going into these, going into oxygen debt. Right? Because if you think about it, you know, if you are kind of, if you are kind of in kind of this active recovery, then you're kind of breathing and are able to kind of regenerate the stuff while you're moving. But if you like really use everything up, you're going to just have to like stop and recover from it all. Um, question. Um, I mean, the other thing that's kind of interesting about this if I put a blood pressure cuff or a tourniquet around your arm, like let's say here's your arm with your hand. And we just kind of pump this up and cut off so there's no blood flow anymore. Could you keep like wiggling your fingers and making peace signs and doing stuff? If there was no blood flow, could you keep moving your hand around? 
Yes. Yeah, and why, why is that? Because your muscles don't always need oxygen to move. Right, we just talked about that. We have these two different ways to make ATP that don't need oxygen at all. So you've got at least like a minute and a half of really moving your fingers around. You know, if you're really doing at maximum rate, after about a minute and a half, they're gonna like, ooh, my fingers don't work anymore because you've used up all the aerobic, I mean, anaerobic um, resources, all the glucose and creatine phosphate that's kind of lying there on location to make ATP. Um, so after a while, it's gonna stop working, but you've got at least a minute and a half or so of, of um, ATP that you can make anaerobically to move around, right? If, and you've probably, just from your own experience, like somebody pumps up a blood pressure cuff, we're gonna be talking about this more explicitly in the coming weeks, how you take blood pressure. But when you pump up the blood pressure cuff, this Figmo manometer, you are completely blocking blood flow. And you've probably noticed that your hand didn't totally like become a piece of wood when someone pumps up the blood pressure cuff, you know, but if you left it there long enough, you know, you'd, you would, it would start, stop working. Um, so anyway, so we have been kind of introducing different ways to make ATP. So what I'm going to do now is talk about two main classifications of skeletal muscle fibers. So, oh my goodness, stop this a sec. So skeletal muscle fibers, they all work the same basic way that I've talked about. You know, the sarcomeres um, with actin and myosin and, you know, myofibrils and sarcoplasmic reticulum releasing calcium and all of that. So all of the muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells, are described by the story we've been talking about. But there are different types, different versions that are optimized for different kinds of activity. So we have muscle fibers we call like the red or slow twitch that are more like, you know, for posture. The, uh, let me, you can tell it's actually sunny outside. Um, you know, so muscles that just have to kind of hold, they need endurance, you know, they don't need a lot of strength. For me to just sit up straight in front of the screen here, I'm not fighting a lot of, you know, force. I just need to kind of keep pulling. I need endurance. I don't need a lot of just boom strength. Um, those are going to be these slow twitch red fibers things that are optimized for endurance, but not necessarily for strength or contracting really fast. Whereas, you know, other things like for sprinting away from a tiger or smashing some animal that's attacking me or something, there I want, I want strength, I want speed. Um, not necessarily, the, the, the trade-off is gonna be the endurance. It's like, if you are using doing like a lot of explosive, fast, strong contractions, you're going to be using lots of ATP and you're not going to be able to keep it up. So you're not going to have the endurance. You're not going to be able to sustain it. Like if you're sprinting away from a tiger, hopefully you're getting away pretty quick because you can't just keep running and running and running and running and running and sprinting at top speed. Some, actually within about 10 seconds, you're going to like run out and tiger's going to get you and have dinner or something. So what we're going to do now is kind of look kind of more inside how are these different muscle fibers optimized for these different kinds of, of um, roles they play. So So these are both, these are types of skeletal muscle cells. Um, and I should let you know, there are, these are kind of the two extremes. 
There are other versions that kind of sit in between these two, but it's it's useful to start just by talking about the two kind of, you know, the black and the white, and then we can talk about the gray a little more. Um, so we have red versus white, which we'll talk about. They're also called slow twitch versus fast twitch. They're also called oxidative versus glycolytic. So these are kind of like the names that people use to describe these different kinds of fibers. And again, I've mentioned fiber and muscle cell are synonyms because muscle cells are big, long, thin things. They're often called muscle fibers or muscle cells. So fast twitch fibers or white fibers or glycolytic fibers versus red fibers or slow twitch fibers, oxidative fibers. Um, so now what we're gonna do is look at each of these in detail, compare and contrast is probably going to be kind of a question on your on your ex next exam you know um so the red slow twitch oxidative these are the ones that are optimized more for endurance these ones fatigue quickly So the red or slow twitch fibers, they can keep contracting and they can keep it up. Whereas the white or fast twitch are going to be able to generate contractile force, but then, then they are done and they need to recover. However, the red or slow twitch, these guys here, kind of slower, weaker contractions. This is going to be quicker, stronger contractions. Um, you know, just from your experience of eating chicken, you can get a pretty good hit off of the difference between the red fibers and the white fibers. Right, where, where do you find the dark meat, the red, the red fibers in a chicken? The thighs. The thighs and the legs, right? Because what does the chicken do most of its life? It's just kind of walking around the yard and scratching and trying to find some bugs and seeds and stuff. You know, that's its endurance. The endurance is the walking everywhere. You know, so you, you know, Chickens don't use their legs to sprint, you know. In fact, and where do you find the white meat? Where do you find the things that are fast and quick but aren't going to be designed to have sustained contractions? Where's the white meat in a chicken? The wings and the breast. Yeah, the breast. The breast meat, right? That's the white meat is the breast meat. That's what it uses to flap its wings. Like if you've ever seen Rocky or something, chickens, when they use their wings, it's more just this explosive thing to try to get away. Like, and then they land like, you know, 50 feet away from you and then go back and start walking around, right? So if you're a chicken, you have this kind of fast explosive contraction for your wings, kind of sustained endurance for walking around in your legs. Um, what about, has anybody ever eaten a duck? Yes. What is the breast meat like in a duck? I don't know. 
It's dark, right? It's dark. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of weirded me out the first time I ever ate a duck. Because you're used to like, you know, oh, breast meat's white. But it's like, not if you're a duck. You know, why does it make sense that a duck has dark meat for its breast meat? Or I mean, for its muscles that move its wings, we should say. You know, when we think of them as food, it's meat. But for the duck, it's its muscles. Because they because it swims around. Say, say it again. Is it because it swims around? It's in the water? No, no, no. Because that, they fly far distances. Yeah, they fly. If you, ducks spend a lot of time just up in the air migrating, flying from one place to another. So they actually need their wings to be endurance, right? If you're a chicken, you know, chickens don't like gracefully fly through the air. It's like, oh, look at that beautiful flock of chickens, like, coming, you know, kind of drifting over the lake. No, that's not, that's not what you see. It's the ducks, ducks and geese, you know, are the ones that have sustained endurance for their wings. So they're going to have dark meat for their breast meat. Maybe I shouldn't say dark, I mean, kind of turning them into food, but they're going to have, you know, this red slow twitch oxidative fibers for their wings to, to flap their wings versus a chicken. So I'm just trying to give you a kind of more intuitive sense of how these muscle fibers play out and what kind of roles that they would play. Um, so now we can talk about more details, subtle details. So if I have stronger contractions versus weaker, what's going to actually make that happen? If I want a muscle cell to generate a stronger overall contraction, what do I need to do? What's generating the contraction in a muscle cell? The actin and myosin. Yeah, the actin and the myosin. And what are the organelles that we talked about that are just those big collections of actin and myosin running along the cell? Sarcomeres. So the sarcomeres were the um, kind of in a smaller view, but then the sarcomeres um, all together made up an organelle that we gave a name. So the thing that contains the sarcomeres. Sarcolemma. No, sarcolemma was just the cell membrane. Myofibril. Yeah, the myofibrils. The myofibrils were the organelles that made up that were made up of the sarcomeres. So in white, you know, here you have more myofibrils. Right? Because you know, and so these are going to be larger in diameter. Right? If I look at one of these cells crossways, it's going to have a lot more myofibrils all pulling together versus one of these slow twitch fibers. These are going to be less myofibrils. Smaller diameter. Right? So this means it's not going to pull as fast. I mean, pull as hard because there's less myofibrils, less actin and myosin all pulling together. Oh, it's going to take a lot less ATP to make this thing run as well, because every sarcomere is burning ATP. Um, another thing is they actually have a slightly different version of myosin. These actually have a faster version of myosin. So the heads in the myosin in the white fibers actually snaps faster. So we get stronger contractions because there's more myofibrils, quicker contractions because it's this kind of speedier version of myosin. Um, so that's one way they're different. Another way they're different, though, is how they get their ATP. Right. So this red, you know, from its name, oxidative it's going to be doing cellular respiration. It's using oxygen. So 
For the red fibers, these use cellular respiration to make ATP. And if you're using cellular respiration to make ATP, what do you need lots? What do you need? What's the core place you make ATP using cellular respiration? Oxygen. Mitochondria. You're gonna definitely need mitochondria. And we're gonna need oxygen, so we're gonna have more blood vessels coming in. And there's actually this stuff called myoglobin, which is a lot like hemoglobin that helps hold oxygen in the tissue. And the myoglobin, which is reddish, it's what gives the red fibers their reddish color, is this myoglobin, um, which helps bind O2 in the tissue. So like, yeah, what, what makes dark meat dark? It's the myoglobin. It's this, this uh, molecule, this protein in there that helps hold oxygen for this oxidative uh, muscle tissue. Um, in fast twitch fibers, on the other hand, we're going to be relying on these anaerobic pathways. Um, which means there's glycolysis, which means we need a lot of glucose and the glucose is stored in this um, use sort of as glycogen, basically. So there's going to be like little glycogen granules. Like, you know, when you're carbo loading, you know, people carbo load before they go on a run or something. Partly what you're doing is just making sure that there's plenty of glycogen that is going to be stored in the muscles ready to go for when you need it later. Um, there's going to be creatine phosphate. Right, so again, these are the things that we use for these anaerobic pathways to make ATP really fast, but again, only lasts for a certain amount of time. It doesn't last beyond a minute and a half before you have to, um, before you have to recover. Um, from here. So, these are white versus red or also called slow twitch or fast twitch also called oxidative or glycolytic and again you can see why those names make sense when you kind of see their properties and how they're constructed and how they're optimized there are other versions there are um fast oxidative fibers i'm not going to go into it if we were doing a more a more elaborate muscle physiology class or something we could talk about the muscle fibers that sit in between these two extremes. Um, but this is the, the basic way when we think about fast versus slow twitch. Um, and you are born just genetically with different um, distributions of red and slow twitch fibers. I mean, red and white fast and slow twitch fibers. You know, how you how you exercise, how you use your body is going to preferentially develop one or the other. If you're doing lots of fast sprinting and heavy power lifting, that's going to be more white fibers that are going to be developed. If you're doing more endurance stuff like, you know, long distance running or low weights, high many reps, that's going to be more of the slow twitch oxidative fibers that are being developed and optimized. Um, however, they don't get interconverted. So like depending on your, the genetic um, kind of deal of the cards you got, given the same kind of training, one person versus another is probably just ultimately going to be a better sprinter or a better distance runner because they've just got <coughs> muscles that have the potential just to be better at fast explosive, but not for as long or long endurance but not as fast and explosive so you have some control over how you <coughs> develop and train your body but then there's also um, 
part of it that's based on just your genetics and what kind of ratios and proportions you have of these different fibers in your muscles. Um, so let's continue. Any, I should mention, any questions about these two different kinds of fibers? Okay. So what we're going to do now is talk about the force generated by a muscle cell in response to a um, action potential coming down a motor neuron, right? Remember we had like our motor neuron go into some muscle cell. And basically once that signal goes down there, we have all that excitation contraction coupling and then this thing pulls. So that's what I'm talking about. The force, how, what's the force that this thing is pulling in response to having a signal coming down the motor neuron that's exciting this muscle? So this is just supposed to be an excitation coming down my, my motor neuron here. Obviously there's gonna be a little bit of a time lag you know, the signal gets to the end, we have to release acetylcholine, we have to have a depolarization across the entire sarcolemma, we have to release calcium, calcium has to bind troponin, troponin has to move tropomyosin, actin has to form a cross bridge with the, with the myosin, and then finally we pull. So there's a bit of a lag, and then there's a force, we pull. This is called a twitch. Right, it's an all or none thing. You can't have a heavy twitch or a weak twitch. Um, it just happens based on the muscle cell and how much, how many myofibrils are in there or whatever. Um, typically, having a muscle just twitch is not that useful. Typically, you kind of want to turn it on, have it um, kind of pull and contract. And to do that, you kind of send a constant stream of signals down the motor neuron. In which case, it starts building up. They call it trepe because it looks like kind of steps. Basically, as you release more and more calcium into the cell, all the actin and the myosins are getting to pull on each other. So we have what's called tetanus. This is your maximal sustained contraction. Right, so this, and this is obviously going to depend on, you know, how many myofibrils are in there and stuff. So this is basically the muscle is turned on, the muscle cell is pulling. And then what happens is you start losing force. So I'm having this come down, not because I'm drawing it sloppy, but because I'm saying that it's losing the ability to generate force, even though I'm continuing to excite it. So this is called fatigue. So notice this is something physiological with the muscle cell. You're continuing to stimulate the motor neuron, and yet the muscle cell is just starting to develop less and less and less force. Um, and this is different from what, like, you know, when we think, use that word fatigue, we use it in different ways. Like, you know, central fatigue is like in your brain. Like, oh man, I'm tired, I don't wanna move. But you could move. If you kind of snapped out of it, your muscles will work just fine. So when we talk about this, this is something more baked into the actual physiology of the muscle cell. You're, you're, act, you're sending messages down the motor neuron, but it's just not generating force anymore. Um, 
one of the kind of crazy things is we still don't totally understand why this happens. You know, in the years since I've been teaching physiology, the basic story of sliding filament theory is rock solid. The idea of actin and myosin sliding past each other and calcium binding troponin, that's all very well supported as the deeper people look at things. However, looking at why muscle fibers fatigue, why the muscle starts, starts to lose force, that story has changed. It's actually in the, again, the years since I've been teaching this class, there's been a few different stories. And I, at this point, I haven't looked really recently, but um, I'm, I'm not sure there's a definitive story even right now of exactly why this happens, which again, I think is important to, for you guys to realize something as fundamental as muscles fatiguing, like obviously by now, you know, science must tell us why, but there's a lot of deep mysteries that, you know, we continue to uncover. It's kind of why physiology and all of this is kind of still really interesting and fun to do because there's lots of cool questions that we don't know. Um, yeah, he says the rabbit hole goes very deep. Uh, when you're trying to actually figure out what exactly is going on in the body, it's like there's so much mystery still. Um, so fatigue. So this leads to a couple of questions, which we're going to answer presently. One is when you turn on a muscle cell, you basically generate this force that, you know, at tetanus. But you can't really tell the muscle cell turn on and pull a little weaker or turn on more strongly. It's basically on or it's not on. And obviously, an overall muscle has a lot of force that you can change. Like if I have my cat, I can gently pet my cat. Or if I'm like pissed, I can bang a hole in a wall, right? You know, you can have the same muscle do like really strong forces or really gentle caresses. But it's obviously not happening at the level of an individual muscle cell because a muscle cell is either on or off. You know, also, I can sustain contractions for a long time. I can like take a stapler and hold it here. And I could sit here for the next half an hour and just hold and isn't it a beautiful stapler and while individual muscle cells are fatiguing, obviously the overall muscle is not because I'm able to just continue to hold this for a long time. So let's talk about how the muscle cells are actually connected up in the organs that we call muscles and how we can actually generate graded contract times, contraction strength and maintained contractions, even though individual muscle cells tend to fatigue. And it's all going to come down to the idea of the motor unit. So a motor unit is basically a, actually it's going to be faster. I'm going to use my typer tool. and it's going to be a somatic motor neuron and all the muscle cells that are innervated by that motor neuron. So let's say we have a muscle. Let's say your biceps brachii muscle or whatever muscle. So the big muscle is this big organ, right? This is like some muscle going from like your forearm up to your upper arm. Maybe this is brachialis to like bend your elbow or something. So this is the big muscle. This is the entire muscle. 
And now we can think about individual motor units. We have some motor neuron here. I'm going to do the blue motor neuron. And it is going to innervate a... Whoop, let me do it. Let's let this be a collection of... These are my muscle cells, my muscle fibers. And my... Again, these are muscle fibers. This is my motor neuron here. So this is a motor unit. Um, another motor unit, I'll do my green motor unit. So I'm going to have my green fibers in here. And I'm going to have my green motor neuron, which is going to innervate the green fibers. And I'll have my red motor unit. Here's all the red fibers. And I'll have my red motor neuron innervating the red fibers. So this is basically the idea of motor units. A muscle is made up of muscle fibers, which again, when they contract, they pull. And you have different groups that are operated by different motor neurons. So if I want to have more or less overall force that the muscle is pulling, even though any particular muscle fiber either is on or off, I can decide how many of these motor units to turn on and I can add or subtract them to generate more or less overall force on this muscle. And we call the idea is recruitment. If I recruit less motor units, I'm gonna have less overall force. If I recruit more motor units, I'm gonna have more overall force. Right? If, I, if I'm going to just gently caress my cat, I'm not going to have to recruit so many motor units because I don't have to generate a whole lot of force. If I want to punch a hole in the wall, I'm going to be recruiting lots of motor units all at the same time so I can generate maximal force. Um, how many muscle fibers do you think are in a motor unit? Can it be like two or a thousand? Yeah, it's going to depend on how much control you need over the over the force. Like if you're looking at the muscles that operate your fingers or move your eyeball around, then it's literally like, you know, four or five fibers per motor unit. And that means that you can adjust the force by a tiny little bit more or a tiny little bit less. So your fingers have incredible control about a little more force, a little less force by adding in just three or four mus muscle fibers or subtracting three or four muscle fibers. When you get to like your biceps muscle, like I'm talking about, there it's more like 50 to 100 or so, a couple of hundred fibers you're adding or subtracting. So you don't need such fine control. If you get to like your calf, you know, it might be like 500 muscle fibers per motor unit because you don't need that real fine control like with just kind of pushing your toes up and stuff. So, you know, how many motor unit or how many fibers are in a motor unit depending depends on where you're looking and how much fine control you need or if you need coarser control over the amount of force you're generating. So th th does that make sense? And then getting back to the, um, you know, you know, if I am going to like, okay, here, let's say this is an art class instead of a instead of a physiology class. And this is my pose. 
got sakuras. It's like the we got all the cherry blossoms and then you know little choco cat here and I'm posing and it's a cool scene and now you're all gonna sit for the next half hour and draw me. And I'm gonna just stand here and keep my pose. So how is it that I'm able to keep this pose even though my muscles need to generate force against gravity to keep choco cat off the ground. But we know that each of those muscle cells is fatiguing. As my muscle generates force against gravity, the muscle cell eventually starts fatiguing and stops generating force. And yet Choco Cat stays up here. You know, how is it that my muscles of my arm are able to keep this little tape dispenser here and it's not just falling down as my muscle cells start fatiguing? The muscle Did units take cite? turns. Say it again. Do the muscle units take turns? Exactly. The muscle units take turns. So you get this thing called asynchronous recruitment. So while one, wait, <laughs> asynchronous. Um, while, let me draw this. So while some muscle unit, motor units are recovering, other ones can take over. And then when those are going to fatigue, we rotate and some other group takes over. And when those are going to fatigue, we rotate and some other ones take over. Right. So that way you can have some motor units recovering while other ones are taking up the load. You know, so it's, you know, very different if, you know, if I was, you know, going to do some pose with some weight I mean, this way, it's not that heavy, but let's say I have some really heavy weight. And my pose is now with a heavy weight and eventually like um, I'm not going to do this for the next half hour. I have to put it down. Why is that? You try to if you try to really hold something really heavy, eventually you can't you, you give up. You have to, it, it, you just stop losing the you lose the ability to keep keep generating force. And what's going on there? more of the motor units had to be recruited to hold it in the first place. Yeah, so if you're, you know, if you're using a majority of the motor units to generate the force you need to hold up this heavy thing in the first place, there's no motor units waiting in the wings to take over while those recover. You just got to put it down and let your muscle recover. Right? Right, this asynchronous recruitment only works if the overall force you're generating is not using a majority of your motor units to generate the force, right? That, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, okay. All right, so at this point we are done with skeletal muscle. Um, what we're going to do now is, you know, not in a lot of detail, but briefly talk about smooth muscle. So smooth muscle is going to also be like skeletal muscle in that there's actin and myosin that pull and generate contractile force, but then there's going to be a number of differences. Um, so let me, before we get into kind of some of the more kind of anatomical detail, let's just talk about some of the basic differences, smooth muscle. Um, one thing is, you know, can be stimulated to contract in a variety of ways. You know, what is the only way that you can stimulate a skeletal muscle? 
if you want to do excitation contraction coupling, if you want a skeletal muscle to contract, what has to happen? What does the body, how, how, does, it, how does it get triggered? By the uh, somatic nervous system. Yeah, exactly. A somatic motor neuron sends a signal and excites that skeletal muscle. So for smooth muscle, there are autonomic motor neurons. Um, obviously, right, sympathetic, parasympathetic. So that is one way, but that's only a, one of the variety of ways smooth muscle can be stimulated to contract. Um, it can also be stimulated to contract by hormones. You know, I, I've kind of mentioned this when we talked about like epinephrine, you know, adrenaline. Adrenaline can make your pupils all of a sudden go wide. That's because smooth muscle in your in your iris is contracting in response to this adrenaline in your bloodstream. Um, it can also um, change, um, you know, it changes the diameter of your bronchial passages, all that kind of stuff. So hormones can cause smooth muscle to contract. Um, there's different chemicals. Um, when we get more into detail in the cardiovascular system, just like levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the tissues are actually going to affect the smooth muscle in the walls of the blood vessels and cause vasodilation or vasoconstriction. So just having different chemicals in the environment can actually trigger smooth muscle to contract or not. stretch of the muscle fiber. This one is a little, um, let me explain this a little more. Back. Like let's say I have smooth muscle in the wall of some vessel. If I push a lot of pressure and kind of stretch this thing out, that is going to actually trigger a contraction where the muscle is going to push back. Um, imagine I had a wall of muscle and I pushed on the wall and I kind of stretched it out a bit as I pushed it, all of a sudden the whole wall would and push me back. Um, this is actually going to be important in kind of the local autoregulation of blood flow as well when we get to that in a little bit. So it is important to realize that if you stretch smooth muscle fiber, it actually responds by pushing back at you or contracting. Um, um, another way it can... I should add one more thing. So smooth muscle, rather than just being these big, long um, rods, smooth muscle, they're individual single nucleate cells. You know, they have actin and myosin, but the actin and myosin are connected more in kind of a lattice. So, like, I'm not going to go into the details of this because of the time right now, and it's not as important to us. But basically, the blue here is supposed to be the actin, the red is the myosin. 
So we have actin and myosin, myosin sliding in the gap between actin, but rather than being in this alternating sarcomere arrangement, it's in more of a lattice arrangement. So that's why it looks smooth. It doesn't look stripy because we don't have that same alternating arrangement of actin, myosin, actin, myosin, actin, myosin in a line. It also means when it squeezes, it more kind of squishes the whole thing. Like a smooth muscle cell, when it's stretched, looks like that. A smooth muscle cell, when it's contracted, kind of squishes up like that. It doesn't just pull in a linear direction. The whole thing kind of just squishes in on itself. Um, <coughs> all of these muscle cells are connected with gap junctions in between. which means if you stimulate one muscle cell, the whole crew all gets co-excited because that electrically connects them. So if one of them is depolarizing across its sarcolemma, they all are. Um, most smooth muscle is what we call single unit. Right, we talked about motor units where you could turn on more or less of the fibers to have more or stronger or weaker contractions. Most smooth muscle is just you either like tell the whole mass squeeze or tell it to relax. Um, there are some exceptions like the smooth muscle that that does the focus of your lens or the diameter of your pupil is actually multi-unit um, smooth muscle. So there is some, there is some examples of these kind of motor units like we saw for skeletal muscle, but for smooth muscle. Again, for me, I know the examples I know particularly are doing the lens and the iris of your eye. But more generally, you can just think of smooth muscle as a big collection of fibers that all kind of contract together. The um, neuromuscular junction for these you know, autonomic motor neurons, it's very different. An autonomic motor neuron comes in, it doesn't actually talk to one particular cell. It tends to come in, it has what they call varicosities. So this is my autonomic motor neuron. These we call varicosities. And they basically puff the neurotransmitter just out. This is my neurotransmitter. Right. In, in the case of an autonomic motor neuron, what is it puffing out at the smooth muscle here? Oh, come on. What does a autonomic motor neuron release at its target muscles? Isn't it either going to be um, acetylcholine or adrenaline? Yeah, or norepinephrine. If it, when, when you're looking at synapses like this, it's typically norepinephrine. The epinephrine is used more as a hormone, but yeah, exactly, right? It's gonna be acetylcholine or norepinephrine, right? That's that's what the autonomic nervous system does. If it's parasympathetic, it's acetylcholine. If it's sympathetic, it's norepinephrine. Um, again, that's that's kind of stuff. When you walk away from this class, you should that should feel you should kind of own that because that's at the core again of so much of the kind of pharmacology and treating different things. You want to, you want that to make sense. Um, <clears throat>
but yeah, the smooth muscle being operated or being stimulated by an autonomic motor neuron, it's not like this neuromuscular junction where there's a synaptic bouton at a neuromuscular junction stimulating an individual fiber. Here we're just more indiscriminately puffing out the neurotransmitter at this family of smooth muscle cells that are all interconnected with gap junctions and just getting the whole crew to contract as a single unit. So that's smooth muscle. A um, couple of others. So smooth muscle differs from skeletal muscle in that it can be it can be um, triggered to contract in many ways, not just by motor neurons. It's different in that we have, you know, obviously the actin and myosin is laid out in a different format in this lattice, so it doesn't have a stripy appearance. It's different in that the cells are interconnected with each other, so they tend to, you know, work as a single unit. Um, it's different actually in other things as well. We're not going to get into. Don't worry about some of the details. Like for smooth muscle, the calcium is still important for contraction, but it tends to come in from outside the cell rather than from being stored inside the cell. Um, another big difference about smooth muscle, though. Let me maybe erase this stuff so I can add this, keep it on the same page. Now I'll just put it on a new page. So in fact, I'll use the type tool so I can just do this quick. So smooth versus skeletal. So one I was saying smooth, you know, can be stimulated. We don't have to put that into detail because we just talked about that in lots of detail. Another thing, though, is smooth muscle can sustain contractions with much less ATP. So this is important because a lot of smooth muscle has a job to just hold, like the muscle in your blood vessels has to basically hold the diameter and maybe adjust, but you know, it spends a lot of time just holding. Um, you know, all the sphincters, like the reason you aren't peeing or pooping on yourself right now is all the smooth muscle in your urinary and anal sphincters is just squeezing and holding and just never relaxing. So a lot of the smooth muscle just wants to hold and sustain a contraction. And there's kind of a special way that the myosin kind of latches into the actin that allows it to sustain a contraction without continually burning lots of ATP like a skeletal muscle would need to do to sustain a contraction. So that's another difference between smooth and skeletal. Um, obviously, there's going to be trade-offs. Um, you know, it contracts like maybe 30 times slower than skeletal muscle. Ah, I did not do that slower. Um, Right, so it can be stimulated to contract in a variety of ways, whether it's autonomic motor neurons or chemicals or hormones or stretch. It can sustain contractions using only 1% of the ATP compared to skeletal fibers and contracts a lot slower than skeletal muscle fibers. Um, you know, so that's that's where I'm going to leave. There's, you know, 
there, it's, it's interesting to get deeper into some of the physiology of smooth muscle, but it's not going to really bias much for um, the amount of time that we're going to, we would put into it. So I would say we're going to leave this here.